Okay, the first um, speaker is Sandy, and she'll be talking about Agenda 21. After that, we might have a short break, if we've got time. And after that, we'll have Lance talking about um, Northall Rebellion and the Magna Carta. And then we'll have Dave, who will talk about how we're going to do the Northall Rebellion. Okay, over to Sandy. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for coming tonight. It's really great to see so many people here. Um, really, really great turnout, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask the audience, how many of you have heard of Agenda 21? Great! Wow, fantastic. Well, um, thank you. Um, uh, it's, it's difficult, really, because Agenda 21 it's been um, rolled out in America and Australia um, a lot more forcibly at the moment than it, it has done uh, here. And mainly because uh, we actually have our constitution at the moment. Now, um, at the moment, Agenda 21 is um, it's, it's not mandatory here, but it's, it's after November the 1st, it will be, and it will be rolling out in the same way that it's rolling out in America. Now, you won't be hearing about Gender 21 on mainstream television or any other newspaper or anything else. The only way to find out about it is actually to look at alternative stuff. So, um, basically, Gender 21, this is a basic overview. It's, um, it's a, a document. It's not a, it's not a conspiracy theory. It's here. This is it. It's written by the UN, and it was actually formulated from a summit called the Earth Summit in 1992, and it's held in Rio de Janeiro. Um, and it's a 40-chapter document, um, and it's really about how to implement uh, the way we should be living in the future. And it's all about, really, um, us humans being responsible for anthropogenic global warming and all the other dreadful things in the earth. And it's got nothing to do with banks or corporations being the bad guys, it's us. We are really bad people. And uh, so it's, um, it's basically, it, it started off, my interest in it started off when I, um, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to get this sorted. <laughs> uh, Oh ah, yeah, this one. Yeah, whoever you are, you know, whatever your politics, whatever your religion, whether you're happy or not, whether you're gay, straight, or something in between, whether you're young or old, whether you're male or female, whether you're employed or not, whether you're single or not, whether you have children, it really doesn't matter because it will affect you. Um, Um, we've done that one. It is the 40-page um, chapter document at the Earth Summit, and it was put together by a man called um, Maurice Strong, who I'll be talking about later, and uh, various other people. Um, my interest in Agenda 21 um, came really from the flooding last year on the levels. I was uh, I was down there quite a bit helping some friends do a documentary and um, with others. And uh, we realised that there's something horribly wrong about the flooding on the rivers. And uh, this is what Christopher Booker, a local journalist, had to say. Flooding, the Somerset Levels disaster is being driven by an EU policy. EU directives actually require certain planes to become flooded. And he wrote that, he's a freelance journalist, he doesn't just work for the Telegraph. Um, and he, um, he wrote that in the Telegraph in uh, last this year when the flooding was happening. This is Christopher. <coughs> um, and what he wrote. Basically, my, yeah, he's talking about his, his co-author Richard North. And they realised that um, 
there was an act, a policy to, to flood the levels. Um, and it came, came out of um, this, which I'll be talking about later, which is the Global Biodiversity Assessment. This is a summary of a huge document, which is like a big telephone directory, which I couldn't get hold of. You don't seem to be able to get hold of it these days. Uh, my friends in America have got a copy. Um, anyway, it came out of that. Um, and uh, it's uh, basically that they're, they're deliberately designed to allow flooding, not just in Somerset, but elsewhere in the country, all in the name of putting the interests of biodiversity, sustainability, and wildlife habitats above those of farming and people. These have included the EU's Natura 2000 strategy, along with a sheaf of directives on habitats, birds, water, and not least floods, directive 2007 which specifically requires certain floodplains to be allowed to flood. In 2008, when the um, Environment Agency was run by Baroness Young, this was reflected in a policy document which classified areas at risk of flooding under six categories, ranging from those in Policy 1, where flood defences were a priority, down to Policy 6, policy six where to promote biodiversity, the strategy should be to increase flooding. The Somerset levels were covered by Policy 6. And the, um, well, how do I? Press the, <laughs> press the right cursor button. Oh, thank you. <laughs> the right cursor button, that one. Ah, thank you. Brilliant. Um, if, it goes the wrong, if it goes the wrong way, press, press the other direction. Cheers. <laughs> um, oh, it's gone back to the other one, isn't it? Um, press the other direction. That one. <laughs> this is policy six. Um, and as you can see, um, it's slightly cut off there, but take action to increase risks to the benefit of other areas, flood defence, flood redistribution or something. But that, basically, that area, that pink area, was the actual area that got flooded. This policy was created in the 90s, and that is the exact area that got flooded. So um, <clears throat> we know that there is an agenda here, um, and it's, you'd say, well, why, why would they do that? Why, why would our environment agency actually flood our land? And uh, we'll find out a little bit later because it's all about taking land over and not wanting human beings to actually inhabit the land. So how did this all start? Um, it started with this book in 1987. Um, this book is uh, a book written by Morris, well it wasn't actually, it was a, it's a report, it's not a book, it's a report. And it was, um, it was brought together by the um, Brundtland Commission, um, which basically was um, Morris Strong and uh, Ro Harlem Brundtland, who was the, um, she was the Prime Minister of Norway. Now, they were sitting in the EU at some point and they decided to put this together as a, it was the, the idea really, and it was the idea that wealth needed to be redistributed around the earth, which is a very worthy thing actually, and affluent countries were destroying the planet, which they probably are, you know, with the corporations and such. But it was an idea, and I think, to be honest, if it wasn't for the fact that Morris Strong was one of the people that put it together, it seems that, you know, I've not found anything bad about um, Gro Brundtland. She, she, was a, she seemed to be a, a very fair lady. Um, but uh, I'm a little bit worried about Morris Strong having anything to do with this because he has proved himself to be quite a duplicitous, rather dodgy bloke. Um, <laughs> And uh, you have to really question where these ideas come from because sometimes a really good idea can have a, a darker agenda behind it. And I think there's lots of very well-meaning people who actually are doing a lot of things to do with Agenda 21 and they don't realise that actually there could be something rather dark behind it. And it's about grabbing a good idea and then turning it into a political agenda which is what, how I feel, um, this is actually, this is the way this has gone. Um, and, you know, it's, we'll, we'll see that as, as we go on. Um, this is the Brundtland Commission. Um, that's um, Gro Brundtland, she's a, a, 
she was a socialist, her politics were socialist, and she was a woman who um, apparently the, the, was the main target from the man who went mad and shot everyone in Norway. And his name was Brevik or something. Um, because of her socialist ideals that he, you know, they didn't want. Uh, and since then, Norway has gone very, very right wing, I believe. But um, she seemed, she's, she was a doctor, and she's a member of the World, she, I think she's a director of the World Health Organization. Uh, this is Maurice Strong, and he's a guy I've really got an issue with, actually. <laughs> um, he's best known as the godfather of Agenda 21. Uh, he headed the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro. He was kind of heading the whole thing. Um, he was born in 1929. Uh, he entered the United Nations at the age of 17 as a junior officer and worked alongside the Rockefeller brothers. Um, he was chairman of the WWF, um, which is also, um, you'll see, is also another uh, sort of land grabbing um, organisation, uh, as well as doing good stuff. So it's, it's really, really difficult to work out. You know, who, well, it's not difficult to work out who the man was, but anyway. Um, anyway, he, he wrote um, the introduction to a book published by the Trilateral Commission called Beyond Interdependence, uh, Measuring the World's Economy and the Earth's Ecology by Jim McNeil, and David Rockefeller wrote the foreword. It was, he was involved in the oil food scandal of the UN funding in North Korea with arms dealer Adnan Shepashelby, so he hangs around with pretty dodgy people. Um, <coughs> He aims to create a world of governance using the cloak of sustainable green politics, Agenda 21, and he colluded to promote the global warming um, theory with uh, Al Gore making money out of carbon credits, and he was said to have written Al Gore's book, The Inconvenient Truth. Um, and he's quoted as saying, it's simply not feasible for sovereignty to be extended unilaterally by individual nation states, however powerful. Current lifestyles and consumption patterns of the affluent middle classes are not sustainable. A shift is necessary which will require vast strengthening of the multicultural system, including the United Nations. So that's him. <laughs> so, um, out of this came this. So, um, oh, <laughs> came this one and then came this one, which is basically, this was the idea, this was the action plan, and this one, only a much bigger version, was the, um, really, how it was going to be rolled out, how they were going to get this into our local councils, into our local, into our back, back, back gardens, actually, um, and it's called the Global Biodiversity Assessment, and it's huge. This is just the summary. Um, and it's a, a 1,140 page document, Agenda Put Into Action. It was a blueprint for policy makers, published in June 1997, a global plan for humanity, include, and it includes the US Wildlands map, which I'll show you in a minute, which is quite shocking. Um, from this came ICLEI. Now, ICLEI um, is, is it's the International Committee for Local um, in uh, what you, uh, foreign in, member. In, 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 in environmental initiatives. That's it. I've, just, I've not put it on there for some reason. Oh, it's on the next line. Well, there you are. Um, International Committee for Local Environmental Initiatives, and it's it's the. If you like, it's it's what rolls out this agenda. ICLEI was formed to bring um, the biodiversity assessment into our local councils. Um, and it was set up, yeah, to implement it right down from global to local. Um, ICLEI's working now in most local councils in the UK. And uh, it works in a, in a, you know, none of these people are actually elected. This is what, you know, we have issues, well, I certainly have issues with, is that all this is done without our, you know, I'll say so. Um, all these decisions are being made um, by people who actually have no, um, we, we don't know who they are, we don't know what they're doing, and it's our money, more than anything else, it's our money that's being spent. And, uh, you know, this is where our taxes go if we, 
before I get right down. Um, uh, they talk about smart, smart growth. This is a, an Ickley term. And um, anything smart, you need unsmart. Um, and basically, um, they, they are allocated money uh, from, our, from our government, from our taxpayers' money. And they then put it into... Um, <clears throat> it, on this one, I mean, basically what's going to happen with smart growth is we'll get increased petrol prices, um, manipulated transport patterns, uh, forcing people to migrate from rural to urban areas due to cost, and um, it's really stopping people moving into the countryside. This is what will roll out with SMART. So money is allocated to NGOs, which are non-governmental organisations, and non-governmental bodies, as well as what they call arms length bodies. So the money is filtered down through these, um, through these different organisations um, in order to um, sustain smart growth. Um, there's another, there's probably another. Yeah, smart growth is smart streets, smart housing, smart meters, visioning projects, urban communities, public-private partnerships, so that's bringing um, public money into the private sector. There's a lot of that going on, transfer of public money into the private sector. Because all these um, NGOs and um, non-governmental organisations and what they call arm's length bodies are not accountable. They are just simply um, quangos set up by these people, uh, by the UN and the EU, in order to get their agenda fed through. Um, and it's, it, they're using public money to do so. Um, so they have urban communities, public private partnerships, historic preservation, English heritage are used like this, sustainable communities, walkable communities, environmental justice, multi-use dwellings, greenways, high-density urban units and buffer zones. We'll be talking about that later because there, there is a, um, a plan to get people out of all of the countryside. Now that seems quite shocking, uh, but it's, it's happening in America, it's happening in Australia, where this is being implemented far more quickly than it is here. And they you know, if, if you take it to its logical conclusion, and you'll see by some of the facts we've put together um, a little bit later um, in the uh, PowerPoint, that in fact, um, a lot of, they, they, they've got plans to actually um, encourage people, not encourage, but to force people out of the rural areas into stack and pack housing in urban areas because it's not sustainable for us to be in the countryside. So, um, how does it work? Well, first of all, they, um, they set up a planning group of NGOs and non-governmental organisations and all these boring kind of quangos that they set up who are all being paid vast amounts of our money, by the way. Um, and then they take it to a local committee or council and then they put their plan forward. And the council will probably throw it out, I don't know. And so they, go, they keep going back and then finally they, they put together a survey and that's to endorse it. And they, they do this and they, they make a survey up and they then go out and ask a handful of people to prove that they've got some consensus of the public to agree to it. And sometimes with these surveys only 2% of the population participate, participate. And then they go to a visioning meeting and they vision whatever they... Their visioning is a big thing with them. With Italy, and they vision how the world should be, and how they, the, or how they, the, the town should be, or whatever it might be. And they got, they get money to do so, and then they put it into an implement, uh, into implement, implementation committee, and they get it ratified. And somehow, all that's done without us having any say at all in the matter. And that's how they work. And underneath it, all are the stakeholders, who are basically the shareholders who put the money up for this and they will make all the money out of the smart growth because they, they are the developers, all the people that put in the infrastructure to, to maybe build these smart cities. Um, so all this is actually... Um, yeah, Gary Lawrence, the US Smart Growth Leadership Council, he says, um, participating in a UN advocated planning process would very likely bring out many who would actively defeat any elected official undertaking. A 
Agenda 21. So we will call our process something else, such as comprehensive planning, growth management, or smart growth. So they know jolly well that we wouldn't agree to it, so they want to call it something else. Right, this is, um, this is the Wildlands map of America, taken from this one. Now, um, what's the colour you see most of on there? Red. Yeah. Well, that's where the humans aren't allowed, <laughs> according to the, this assessment. And this is, actually in, this is actually ratified and it's going ahead in America. And there's a lot of um, bad feeling about Agenda 21 in America. And uh, the lady that's heading up the battle against this in America is a lady called Rosa Coyer. Um, spelled K-O-I-R-E, Rosa, and she is uh, an amazing woman who's, who's really blown the whistle on Agenda 21 in America. And she has, um, she's a number of stuff, on a number of uh, films on YouTube, she's incredible. And uh, some of the southern states, now Lance will tell me, who's not, who's opted out of, out of it in America? Uh, first state to opt out was Alabama. Very quickly followed by Georgia, Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, Oklahoma, uh, I believe Oregon, Colorado, and California are now defeating it. So, um, there you are, thanks, Lance. Um, so, basically, the humans aren't allowed in the red areas. Now, what's the other area that you see most of? Yellow. 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 They're not allowed there either. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that's purely for federal agencies and military. So the red areas are complete no-go areas. That's, that's um, an area that's called, it's rewilded, or it's called the wildlands, and it's full of, um, they're re restocking, but their idea is to restock it with bears, wolves, um, I don't know, whatever animals, <laughs> like dinosaurs, who knows. But they, they, they're gonna, it's going to be lots of wild animals, put it that way. Loads of wild animals, so nobody would want to go there anyway. Um, and uh, they, the rest of it is yellow, which is only for federal agencies and military and police and stuff. And um, so where do you think the humans are? On Mars. <laughs> well, there's, there's the pink ones, the Indian reservations. Looks like the Indians have done better than the rest of us. Um, but the but the humans, sorry, can I just do that? The humans are these little dots here. These little, this is where the humans live. Um, and, and the humans are in, in urban, uh, what they call, what do they call them? They call it um, human dwellings or human, I can't remember what they are. What do they call the, where do, where do the humans live? Zones, that's it. Human live with zones. They're basically zones. It's, it's kind of stack and pack housing, uh, all smart metered, all surveilled. Um, anybody remember the prisoner in the 1960s, 70s? Yeah, yeah. Well, a bit like that, really. And you'll all have a number. <laughs> well, you won't, but, but you'll be in a zone with a number. You'll be in a zone with a number. We already have a number. Oh, well, there you are. <laughs> you came to know. Um, so, so that's it. That's the wildland. Now, I've been looking for a similar map because I know that we have a, a wildlands um, uh, project in um, Agenda 21 for Britain. And all I have found so far is the um, is that there are several um, projects, rewilding projects, going on at the moment, where um, some uh, wolves and bears, I think, have been. Um, uh, reintroduced to Scotland, um, but I, I do feel that this is going to be rolling out um, all over um, all over our, our country too. And I've got some statistics further on in the um, PowerPoint. Yeah, this is the one: the Weapons Project, South World Land. Oh, a big um, advocate of this is this chap, George Monbiot. He's a he's a writer, he's a journalist, and he wrote this book, Feral, which. It's actually quite a good read, but um, uh, it's his, it's his, he, he, he's really backed this whole uh, rewilding scheme because he feels that, you know, in a, in a kind of, in a way, that we need more wildlands. And I'm sure we do, and there's nothing wrong with, with 
um, allowing you know extinct um, animals to come back into our nature. But it has to be in balance, and and that clearly the, the map of the wildlands of America is clearly not balanced. I believe that man can live with animals and trees and everything else quite happily without putting in, being put into stack and pack housing. Um, Basically, you know, the Wildlands and Wetlands projects, and there are several of them in the UK. Whether these people, I don't think these people actually who set some of these projects up realise that they're bit possibly being manipulated by an agenda that is not um, fully, I, I feel, sort of fully comprehensive and good. Um, and I think there's lots of so, you know, really well meaning people behind the rewilding project who don't have a clue where it's heading. Um, now, are they restocking the hunting grounds for the elite? <laughs> this was a, a, something that we thought of the other day because there's a huge market at the moment in millionaires uh, going hunting and let's face it, this is all about global elite trying to take over our world and they do like their hunting. Um, so, talk about rewilding. Private property and farmland is unsustainable. 75% of the US is to be given over to self-willed land and be stocked with wild boars, bears, wolves, and given over to wild vegetation. Um, page 993 of the uh, Biodiversity Assessment plans to remove 50% of the United States population into urban areas or human settlement zones. That's what they're called, I can remember. Um, consisting of high-rise dwelling units that are to be situated near railway tracks. The railroad will be the main means of transportation. Private automobiles will not be permitted. The Obama stimulus is a major source of funding for this project. EU plans to rewild 1 million hectares of land by, in the UK by 2020, which is 2.47 million acres. So where will we be? Well, there are plans to build a smart city in um, Bristol, and I think it's designated as a smart city. So maybe Glastonbury will be a desert, deserted town by then, I don't, you know, but not if we have our way anyway. Um, by 2030, farmers on the European continent will vacate around 75 million acres, roughly the size of Poland, to give away to rewilding. Well, I mean, this is quite revolting. <laughs> um, this, is, this is what's happening with you know, people who've got way too much money, and I don't know what happens when you get money, does your brain shrink, or what happens, but apparently you go killing lions, um, and this guy paid £60,000 to go on a trophy hunting holiday in Zambia. Um, and this lady here, she's a model, an American model, um, she was, uh, she got a sack <laughs> for shooting lions. Um, and there's a, cheer a cheerleader there, these are all kind of celebrities, in America, um, and uh, you know, you know, what, what are they going? What are they going to be doing with this, these wildlands? Um, and if you've ever seen the Hunger Games, you do question what the hell is going to happen, um, because if we are living in zones and uh, the wildlands are there, the brain could uh, really work a few things out. Um, so, what's not sustainable? You aren't sustainable. Especially if you're educated. I did find a quote, and I couldn't put it on the PowerPoint because I couldn't find it there. But basically, it's, um, educated people are less sustainable than poor people because apparently you consume more. Um, uh, walking in the countryside is not sustainable. If you like skiing, that's not, you're not going to be able to ski. Um, the mountains will be given over to mountain wolves and all sorts of mountainous creatures. Um, playing golf. <laughs> we got that right. <laughs> no one likes golf here. Uh, you like golf? No. <laughs> well done. Um, fish ponds in your garden, growing your own organic vegetables and herbs, horse riding. Roads aren't sustainable. Um, private transport isn't sustainable. Private ownership of land and property. And justice isn't sustainable, apparently. Uh, consumerism family unit, and certainly your unalienable rights are not sustainable. Um, and these are the three E's of sustainable development. Social equity, economic prosperity, economic, ecological integrity. Now all of those sound really good, but as I said, you take a really good idea and you, you, you 
be taken by people who have a political agenda, it can be turned around to something very different. Um, except I mean the individual rights subordinated to the environmental needs. You know, we all have individual rights and we are we need to be free thinkers still and not the hive mind that I believe they want us to have. So what does it really mean for us? It means an end to national national and personal sovereignty, an end of the Western democratic process the end of common law, the abolition of private property, the abolition of private transport, the destruction of Western industrialization, the ending of free enterprise, the harmonization of incomes and redistribution of wealth across the globe, the limitation of resource use, energy, water, minerals, Populations to be concentrated in smart cities close to their place of employment. The restructuring of the family unit and increasing limitations on social, physical mobility and individual opportunity. Continuous carbon taxation. Continuous surveillance and monitoring of the population. The end of freedom of choice. The cashless society. Microchip banking. Abolition of the middle classes. And a two-tier feudal society rich global elitists and poor. Now this is um, a few weird policies coming out of, not weird, but uh, coming out of uh, UK government. Um, it's an end to UK sovereignty, European and UN laws applied at local level. Common law and the Magna Carta 1215 will cease to exist in UK after the 1st of November 2014. We will be governed only by commercial maritime law, the law of the high seas through the EU. Now, to some people that might not you know, mean a lot, but basically, we, we cease to be Britain. We become, literally, we're, our, our, our country is given over to a foreign power. And this is where we come from with the lawful rebellion, because, you know, this is treasonous. It's treasonous to give our country away to a foreign power. The Queen promised when she was coronated that she wouldn't do so. And she's gone back on that. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk, well, obviously Lance and Dave um, are better at talking about um, the treason than I am. And that lady up there is actually treasonous to us because we, the people, um, haven't actually um, agreed to this. And um, we, the, the, the monarchy is supposed to look after us. I'll so, be giving up trial by jury as well. Exactly, trial by jury. There's a, well, they'll, they'll talk to, okay. to they'll, they, yeah, I'm doing Agenda 21, but they will talk a lot more about what will happen, really, when that Nice, that, that nice, treaty, is rat, nice treaty is ratified on the 1st of November, because it, will, it, it really will hit us hard. And we don't know how quickly this will all come into play. Um, but we've all got children, grandchildren, families that we care for. And this is not a world that I want my grandchildren. I've got grown-up children. I do not want any grandchildren I may have one day to be living in the kind of way that they will want us to live. Because it's, it's just not. It's, it's so alien to all of us. You know, we want to be able to walk in the countryside and be sovereign beings. Um, yeah. Uh, private property, property and assets stripped away through economic hardship and crippling taxes. The reform of the 1930s, now this is quite interesting. Remember what happened in Cyprus? Um, I can't remember when it was, was it 2011? When there was a bail-in, yeah. And everybody lost, lost their money, they had, a, they had all their money in the bank. In fact, friends of mine lived there and they just sold a property and they were coming back to England and they had the money in the bank and it disappeared, over £200,000 disappeared overnight, they've got nothing now. Um, because they were allowed, uh, the, the, the government bailed in and took the money. Um, and basically as soon as that happened, and we all guessed that it might be a bit of a dry run, um, sure enough, um, the reform of the 1934 Banking Act happened in 2011, covertly rewriting the banking laws by the Swiss Financial Authority to allow bail-ins bail -ins in the UK on the next um, uh, banking crisis. So if we have another banking crisis, they can go into your bank account and take your money. 
Um, and they call it loss absorption. That's nice, isn't it? It's robbery. Um, but loss absorption and bail-ins are important instruments to support any such property grab by the banks. The systematic destruction of our industry. Now, we don't, we don't make anything anymore. We import everything. So what's happened is that it's almost like a, a plan that we A, don't grow anything anymore. Uh, we're actually, you know, our farmers are actually paid not to grow crops. I mean, how mad is that? We import everything. And you go into a supermarket. Now, in, in, last, you know, around, in and around Somerset, we grow the best apples in the world. And it, it makes my blood boil when I go and buy, um, you know, South Africa, or I don't buy them, but when I see South African apples in the, in the shops. Because, you know, it's a nonsense that we don't grow our own food for our own country and eat it. It would be so simple. Instead of shifting all this, now what isn't sustainable? What isn't sustainable is shipping everything from all over the world to other countries. I mean, that would save billions in carbon footprints and God knows what. So it's all a nonsense, the whole thing. The systematic destruction of our industry, the spiraling burden of ever increasing overseas age, pro age programs, children and old people being pushed into privatised billion, multi billion pound care homes. They want the education system to take children from zero um, to 19. I mean, that is just putting babies to school and making it mandatory is just horrendous. Um, so, schools are opening longer with no parental influence. So basically, the state are taking more control of the children, and we know that anyway. Crippling transport costs and soon to be imposed road charging. Destruction, privatisation of the welfare state and national health service. And the highest concentration of CCTV and surveillance in the world. And this is a sort of like a little pyramid of power. <laughs> You've got the UN at the top. In fact, I mean, to be honest, I would put the Vatican at the very top. <laughs> Probably. I don't know. Who knows what, uh, what it is. But then you've got the World Bank, the IMF, UNESCO, which is the education arm of the, um, the UN. Very powerful. They're getting a lot of Agenda 21 into our schools, so our children are learning how to be very, very politically correct and uh, to believe that uh, sustainability is and global and uh, global warming is is anthropogenic. Uh, Club of Rome, and then you've got uh, the the Earth Summit, the Ramsar team, and the WWF. They're the sort of land grab um, arms of the UN. Um, the Ramsar team that happened in Ramsar in, in Iran. Another summit. They always hold these summits. Some are really sunny, like um, Rio or or Iran or somewhere like that. It was before all the troubles, obviously. Um, and uh, and they, they, they kind of they spend a lot of money taking all these uh, UN officials on holiday, really. And uh, they get a bit drunk, a bit of sun, and they sign anything. And that's what they do. Um, you've got the World's Wetland Network, European Union, and Italy, right down to your local councils. And then you've got all the arm's length bodies down there, all, all siphoning off a bit of money and right down to the water corporations and the internal drainage boards which caused all the problems on the levels this year. Now, UNESCO. This is the educational arm of the UN. And um, it was formed in 1947, just after the Second World War. And uh, the man who set it up was a chap called Julian Huxley. He was the brother of Aldous Huxley, who wrote Brave New World. And um, he was a British bio biologist, and he was leader of the British eugenics movement, so obviously a very nice chap. Um, and he was a Darwinist. And um, <coughs> he, uh, he's, yeah, he, he's, he basically set up the UNESCO. And the sole purpose was to, um, to, to bring the UN's agenda into, into the educational system. Um, uh, the task before UNESCO is to keep help towards the emergence of a single world culture with its own philosophy, a background of ideas with its own broad purposes. Um, he wrote a book uh, in 1946 called um, UNESCO, Its Purpose and Philosophy. Um, he's a major figure aligned with the WWF in the 1960s. 
Um, he was a life fellow of the Eugenics Society from 1959 to 1962. Um, and he, his one of his philosophies was from that book was um, the lower strata are responding too fast, therefore maybe they must not have too easy access to relief or hospital treatment, lest the removal of the last check on natural selection should make it too easy for children to be produced or survive. Long-term unemployment should be grounds for sterilization. Um, so that was what he believed. Um, and Thatcher and Bush signed the US back onto UNESCO after a 19-year boycott beginning in 1984 with the Reagan administration for its pro-Soviet, pro-collectivist agenda, saying that it had been reformed for the good of mankind. I don't think so. Um, Huxley believed in a dialectical thinking, in dialectical thinking which is based on the collectivist ideology, ideology that the sole purpose of the individual is to serve the state, um, creating a society of predictable automatons who are incapable of thinking for themselves or only doing so thinking as they are told by so-called experts. Um, UNESCO Associated Schools for Sustainable Development. World Heritage and So it's, it's well embedded into, um, uh, and I'll, I'll go into more really um, uh, about how, it, how it's affecting the, um, the schools really. There's a wonderful woman in America called Charlotte Isabel, um, Isabel, and she's written a lot about the dumbing down of America, the deliberate dumbing down of America. Um, Uh, yes, this is from the conference in Mexico that UNESCO had. Um, yes, they wanted to produce a history of mankind with an emphasis on the understanding of the scientific and cultural aspects of the history of mankind, of the mutual interdependence of peoples and cultures of their contributions to common heritage, the unifying vision, the evolutionary humanism and the evolutionary synthesis. So that's what they were doing in um, 1947. Yeah, this is Charlotte Isby. Um, she's, a, she's in her, I think she's in her 80s now. She's an amazing lady. She um, wrote a book called The Dumbing, Deliberate Dumbing Down of America, which actually is a PDF that you can download on the internet. Um, and uh, she, she was working in schools in America and she realized that there was something horribly wrong because the way she had done uh, taught in the past um, was being overruled. It was, um, there, was no, there was to be no uh, creativity, no free thought in the schools, and it was all prescriptive. And uh, there were uh, all, sorts of, um, all sorts of directives coming in um, that didn't allow her to teach the way that she'd always taught. And she boiled it down and realised it was Agenda 21. Um, and uh, basically, um, a lot of uh, things are happening with, with education where they think that, that it's been taught in schools now that mathematics is man-made, um, which made me laugh. I mean, they obviously we have never looked at a pineapple or a or a nautilus shell or the universe or anything else because man, you know, clearly mathematics isn't man-made and, and they believe also that um, facts are arrived by consensus so if the consensus is that two and two is seven, so be it. And there's, that's just a small um, idea of, of how she feels. I mean, if, if, you, if you can read the book Dumbing down, of, the deliberate dumbing down of America because it's happening in our schools. I mean, I don't know about you, but um, I'm just amazed that we have so many illiterate youngsters nowadays, and they walk on through the school process, and it seems to be something really wrong with our education system because there are some schools that try really hard, and I know a lot of teachers who get very wound up about all the administration they have to do, and they don't teach anymore; they simply administer and that is not right. And we've got a lot of children now coming out of schools who cannot, they, just, they cannot read, they can't write, they can't add, they can't do anything. And uh, that's not good. Sorry, what was her name again? Her 
Her name's uh, Charlotte Isabee. Uh, it's spelt um, I-S-E-R-B-Y-T, Isabee. Charlotte Isabee. She's an amazing lady. She's got lots and lots of stuff on YouTube. Um, and she, she's just a wealth of knowledge. And to be honest, every single one of these slides you could do another hour's talk on. So I'm sorry if I'm glossing through it. Yeah, Brave New World was written by Aldous Huxley, uh, Julian's brother. And it gives an overview of the future world of global control, incorporating surveillance, subservience to the state, and population control, apparently based on insider information. Because he knew exactly what his brother was doing, because they obviously talk. And uh, Brave New World is, is really, and it's so often uh, everything's hidden in plain sight. Something, you know, a film will come out or a book will come out. And it's, it's actually the truth. Um, and uh, that's why I've got a little bit thing of the, thing of the Hunger Games, because I honestly believe that that was, um, thank you. I think that was, uh, that's something that's hidden in plain sight. There we are. So where have all our resources gone? Um, we've got billions of pounds going to, uh, millions of pounds going to um, uh, the Wetlands Project, for instance, in, um, in Somerset, where the birds were, you know, the RSPB were given 20 million um, to, uh, to open a bird sanctuary on the levels and, uh, and to flood it. And basically, we've got our libraries shutting down, our hospitals. Um, we've got lack of staff resources and they're being privatised. We've got um, police stations closing, public houses closing so people can't meet and be in community. Um, and uh, road infrastructure deteriorating and local villages, shops closing. And uh, actually Lance <coughs> pointed out something to me the other, uh, the other evening and he said if you if you want to build a house, if you've got a piece of land you want to build a house, it takes forever to get planning permission. But if you actually are in a town and you want to turn a house into private dwelling, they're very happy. It goes through very, very quickly. To because... Turn the shop into private yeah. Hmm? To turn the shop into private Oh, sorry, what did I say? Oh, house. Oh, sorry, shop. <laughs> Thank you. If you want to turn a shop into a private dwelling, you get planning permission almost instantly because they actually want to destroy our local shops, you know, because they want us to be shopping in places like Tesco's or whatever. And there is this, and like you say they, that I do believe there is a they, and we'll talk about that later. Um, right, our resources have gone. Uh, yeah, this is just a little bit of spending in, that the Environment Agency did. Um, in 2011, they spent 250,000 um, mid, mid 2012 on meetings at private venues, despite having two dozen offices around the country. They spent 7,000 on vehicles, including trucks, more than one official vehicle for every two employees. Um, 2.4 million on PR, um, and yet they refused to pay 1.7 million to dredge the levels when you know, the, the reeds and the, and the uh, rivers. A uh, single water abstra um, abstraction license for Aincliffe costing just £152 cost the taxpayer £611,000 to £1.5 million. Um, you know, this is just a, an idea um, on how our money, our taxpayers' money, is actually squandered by these quangos like the Environment Agency. Now, before the Environment Agency, you had um, the Minister of, uh, Ministry of Agriculture, Farming and Fisheries. And basically, they were, they, they were, they knew what farming was about, the Ministry. They were often um, farmers themselves, or at least been to agricultural college, and they knew what it was all about. They gave um, subsidies um, for growing um, crops and uh, unfortunately the, you know, the, the other side of it, the Environment Agency, um, pays them to not farm and, uh, and they also paid, um, the, the math did actually help with the dredging of the levels. Um, so we've got global players for the international water and land grab, we've got the WWF, 
um, they're the largest organisation in the world. I mean, I'm, I'm just giving you, because the, again, this is another hour's um, talk. If, if you thought the WWF were all good, and I'm sure they, there's lots of well-meaning people in the WWF who do really good stuff, but if you look at it, it goes right back to, um, uh, it, you know, they, they, they took a lot of land of indigenous people, and they, they are an organisation that has a very dark side, so do look it up yourselves. Um, United Nations, we've got the Club of Rome, the World Bank, um, all um, doing, putting policies through to control land. Um, now a lot of people disagree with this, I know. Um, all I can say is that a lot of people gain from promoting climate change. And as you can see there, there's the green investment banks. Um, the corporations, IBM, Siemens, Circa, Growing Smart, all these people have put this agenda forward. Uh, and um, it, it to, as far as you know, we're concerned here um, on this side, we believe it's been the biggest hoax ever. Um, do I need to talk about that? Oh, I know, that one's too busy. What's wrong with Agenda 21? Well, it sounds good to, to lots of well-meaning people. Um, it's a blueprint for global, global transformation, sustainable society, social justice, healthy planet. Why not limit consumption and energy bills? Uh, why not abolish private property? You know, maybe that's a good idea. They're thinking, well, why not establish a global welfare system to, to train parents and monitor and surveil? Um, why not uh, trade cars for bikes? Why not have single dwellings for dense human settlements located near railway lines where everyone can share the common ground and be equal? Uh, why not s separate humans from the countryside and uh, urbanise them in favour of wildlife? Um, well, who has the right to tell us how we should live and where we should live? And who has the right to take our land away with indigenous people of this land and there's no reason why we should live on our land and, and, and farm it and use it as, as we've always done. I can't see that there's any reason other than someone else wants it. And quite honestly, we, we, are, we are sovereign. We, we don't need these huge corporations who are siphoning off the money and doing the damage and the banks. And quite honestly, it's, you know, who has the right? Collectivism creates oppression and control. We'd be totally controlled. Um, and not free. And our freedom is everything. And now there's a, there's a, a thing with property and, and uh, your liberty. And I think it was um, one of the founding fathers, I think it was John Adams, who actually came from Somerset, came from Barnes and David. And, uh, he became the president of America, and he said, you lose your property rights, you lose your liberty, your freedom. And property is a word that's used in law. And if anybody knows the, um, the work of um, Karl Lenz, they'll realize what a strong word property is. And I believe that the property rights, and the, pro the word property, is actually more important than we think. And if we do give up our land, we give up our rights. And I, I think we need to really think about that. Um, yeah, we can't rely on environmental scientists. Now, this is where I believe, and I won't go into the global warming thing because so many people attack me over it. Um, uh, we can't trust environmental scientists who depend on government funding. They're obliged to produce politically useful information that will serve the global hierarchy, uh, not the people, and will lead to economic and social disaster. So, um, this is just a little, um, a little thing. If, you, if anyone's making notes, please uh, do write down these uh, websites. Um, future Warfare, this is a NASA document. And uh, I've forgotten what, <laughs> what is Future Warfare. It's, it's, basically, it's, it's all about um, how, how warfare will, will be progressing. Um, and I've got something to say about that in the Iron Mountain Report. 
Um, the protocols of the, elders of the wise elders of Zion, and that really is, um, is quite a scary thing. Um, and it's, you know, you talk about Zionism, uh, it's not to be confused with Judaism, by the way. Um, the Richard Day speech in 1969, he was a bit of a visionary and he had insider information. And he actually, in 1969, he uh, wrote a book about all of this stuff that's happening now, about the global takeover of the world and, and exactly how it's and will pan out. The Jesuit Oath is um, quite an interesting uh, one. And the Iron Mountain Report, um, basically, um, the Iron Mountain Report <coughs> was written, it was, um, it, was a, it was a document that came out of um, a special study group um, just after the Vietnam War, and they, they met in secret, they were, they were the SSG, and they met in the secret underground nuclear hideout um, in a, a mountain called Iron Mountain. And uh, they spent two and a half years um, debating uh, whether war could be, whether we could stop having wars, whether peace was actually something that was um, uh, able to be um, implemented for, for, for the world. And um, they came to a conclusion after two and a half years that um, peace would almost certainly not be in the best interest of stable society. War, they argued, was simply too important a part of the world economy and, and therefore necessary to continue a state of war indefinitely. So, um, I believe there are the masters of war and we see that every day on our televisions because wherever you see war, you know that there's, there's a, um, an economic agenda behind it. Um, now, the Georgia Guidestones um, are a granite set of, it's a bit like a Stonehenge really, it's, uh, it's in Georgia and it's, uh, it's written, all, all these, um, all these uh, it's a guideline for humanity, it's written in eight different languages and one of the main one that people will always quote is it to maintain humanity under you know basically a, a, a fifth of the sixth of the world's population has to go in perpetual balance with nature no one knows who who put them up um, they cost quite a lot of money and they were put up in the 1980s um, and uh, it seems to me that there is a sort of an agenda to um, reduce the population to one, one billion. Um, stack and pack housing. Now, I've done a bit of research into this recently, and Lance helped me with this. Um, this is um, <clears throat> where, where will the people live? Well, in America, they, they, they're building stack and pack housing everywhere, smart metered to put the people in. And a lot of people are going against that and, and rising up, and uh, certainly in the southern states. And there's virtually martial law in some of the states to not implement Agenda 21. Um, now, the Peel Group, which is um, it's a private real estate, media transport, and infrastructure and investment company. Um, it has a headquarters in Manchester, uh, and it's formerly known as Peel Holdings. Um, the Peel Group seem to be building uh, lots of sustainable development around the uh, Liverpool and uh, Wirral areas and Salford in Manchester. Um, the, the, it's owned by a reclusive billionaire tax exile, John Whitaker, who lives in the Isle of Man. Now he, he is a complete tax exile. He doesn't he doesn't spend any of his own money on all these developments. He um, he gets it from us and from the Saudis. So it's um, he's he's got lots of uh, huge developments going on, um, and he seems to have gained control of the ports in England and Scotland. Uh, he's. Um, it's a very, very complex company. He's the director of an astonishing uh, 
312 companies with interest in Liverpool, Doncaster and Durham airports, <coughs> Manchester Ship Canal, Scottish ports and docks, and the docks along the banks of the River Mersey. He's received billion, millions in EU and UK public grants. Um, he's, if you're a sustainable developer, you automatically get EU grants and um, you get, uh, you're not subject to the um, building regs that most most builders would be um, because uh, you seem to be exempt from it because they, they, they obviously want this smart growth to be built. Um, <coughs> Yeah, they're building uh, Liverpool Waters and Wirral Waters. They're apparently 50 storey high stack and pack housing units, <coughs> both next to railway lines and joined by the Mersey Tunnel. Um, there's the Ocean Gateway. It will take 50 years to complete the Ocean Gateway, develop 50 miles of bleak dockland into a £50 billion development between Liverpool and Salford docks with 50 site skyscrapers. Um, now, the stakeholders uh, also own the ports. Now, this, was a, this is a bit worrying because if you own the ports, you can close them down at any point. And that's worth thinking about. Um, who are these people who are, you know, we're now reliant on all our imports. And how easy would it be to, um, to manipulate us with um, lack of food? Um, well, that's interesting. The Salford Star wrote a, an article and they said, perception that Peel has local governance and local, there, there's a perception that Peel has local governance and local authorities in its pockets. So billionaires can bribe people, they can do whatever they like really, can't they? Right, is it true that the earth is overpopulated? Um, as Dr. Jacqueline Kaysen Humboldt, you know, at Humboldt University has proven statistically that if all people on Earth were placed into the state of Texas, they would have 1,200 square feet of space each. Um, with a gender 21, humans would have no choice where to live. They will be placed in human settlement zone alongside commuter lines. See Biodiversity and Wildlands Project UK. <laughs> Yeah, now is it true about climate change? Um, yes, the climate changes all the time. It does, but global warming is another one. Um, you know, it, climate change, you know, it's the worst scientific scandal of our generation. We, we, we have got climate change, but the climate changes all the time, and it's, a, it's something that naturally happens when the sun is active or not. And it usually um, works that if the sun is very active, we have the, the planet heat, the solar system heats up, and when it's cold, it doesn't. It gets cooler, and we're in, we've been in apparently global cooling now for 15 years. Um, it hasn't heated up, and it depends how many coronal mass ejections are coming out of the sun. Now, I'm not an expert on that. There's a guy called Peter Taylor who is, he does very comprehensive talks on it, so I don't really want to hit on that one too much. Um, this is kind of a bit fun. Um, if you believe in empires, because Eddie picked this up, he said actually empires never go away, they just change. <laughs> and I think he's right actually, it's probably still the same empire that we've got running ours that was, you know, thousands of years ago. Um, historically, empires usually only last about 400 years or so. Um, I don't know how far along we are, but I feel that we're at the end of one, because it's all been sort of coming to a tipping point. Um, and the symptoms are an undisciplined and overextended military, conspicuous displays of consumption and wealth, obsession with pornography, or addiction even, when sexual perversion, debasement of one currency, unnatural obsession with voyeuristic entertainment, like that reality television. Uh, oh yeah, this is quite interesting. There's a, there was a second century um, charioteer called Gaius Apicius Diodes, and he was he amassed in the second century and he amassed um, a fortune of 35 million sesterres, which is some sort of salt based currency, in prize money, which is several billion pounds in our in our money. So um, they would they were they were giving their um, 
you know, the, the equivalent of their footballers, uh, vast amounts of money then. And the other thing is celebrity chefs. Every, um, every, every empire, the Romans, Ottomans and Spanish, all made celebrities of their chefs. So it's, it's a kind of symptom of excess and, um, I suppose, um, you know, just being too greedy. <laughs> um, your birthright. Accept no human intervention between you and your divine creator. You have a natural birthright to oh, yeah, I've done it. Birthright to shelter, natural food, pure clean water, air. Challenge the values of so-called leaders driven by economics, not common sense. We have a responsibility as human beings to look after life, all life, children, people, animals, trees, everything on our blue green planet. Right, I'm, I'm going to stick my neck out and put this on because um, this is this is quite interesting. I'm, I'm sure some of you have heard of Operation Paperclip or Gladio. Um, it, at the end of the Second World War, um, after Hitler had um, apparently blown his brains out in a bunker, uh, the war was over, and uh, the all of his. Um, his cronies, who were top-level scientists who had worked in the um, in the concentration camps, um, were flown. Though they didn't go to the Nuremberg trials, um, only the the, the lower um, echelons of the Nazi Party were taken to the Nuremberg trials and imprisoned for war crimes. All the brains behind it were flown to America and the UK and the rest of Europe and Italy as well. And uh, <clears throat> and uh, they they were put into re research institutions, universities, and government agencies by the Joint Intelligence Objectives Agency. Um, and there's a picture of 104 of them who were rocket scientists. And or they the the, 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 the operation produced these rocket scientists. And um, Operation Gladio was even darker. It went into um, uh, the Mafia and uh, the Italian Mafia and the Vatican. And you can read all about that on a website called Deep Black Lies. And it's, again, it's, that's another hour's talk if you really went into that. Um, because our Operation Gladio, I think, I feel was a lot darker even than Paperclip. But a lot of our um, technologies that uh, came out of uh, Paperclip in the just after the war, are the ones that have taken us into the space race and everything else. And all those technologies, there's a lot of hidden technologies that haven't even come out yet. So um, the, a lot of it is, is, is kind of behind what we are now going to find as transhumanism, which is um, something that our government are funding at the moment. Um, Transhumanism advocate, you know, they, they advocate the improvement of human capabilities, eliminating disease, developing artificial intelligence, and technologies that will seemingly enhance our lives. Well, um, maybe it will, maybe it won't. But the only thing that I've got a problem with is that we're financing this by um, apparently the uh, 2045.com. Is a, is a website, and there's another one called Horizon 2020, which is a government-based uh, institution that's just been set up to finance um, uh, these technologies, the transhuman technologies, which will bring us really into sci-fi land. Um, and uh, you have to ask, you know, if 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 they're going to start making uh, body parts, and we're all going to live 200 years. Um, do you think that might be for the global elite and not for us? Because <laughs> it's all, the, all those things like cryonics, um, gene therapy, culminating in indefinite lifespans. All this is being rolled out and will be rolled out far more quickly when Agenda 21 comes into play. Because this is the ultimate goal, is to create transhumanism. And it's not something that is, um, it's, not a, it's not a conspiracy theory. All this is evidenced. It's all happening. They can 3D print body parts, and it's it's actually really do go into it. Look at look at um, 2045.com, um, and there's something called I don't want to put it up there, 
but uh, something called um, Horizon 2020. And uh, that really goes into it. And that's government funded. That, uh, I think they've got about 70 billion to fund uh, scientific institutions to bring this all forward. So uh, here we've got robotics, 3D printing, self-replicating, um, molecular nanotechnology, um, mega-scale engineering, colonizable large-scale structures on Earth and in space, um, mind uploading. Uh, God, I'd like that. Um, basically, you've got art, an artificial hippocampus in your brain, and you can upload, you know, whole theses without having to read them and stuff like that. Oh, God, that'd be brilliant. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, who, who does this technology serve? If they're going to put us all in stack and pack housing and be wild the wildlands, you know, what what is this all about? You've got to question it. You've got to think, well. You know, do we sit back and allow the Nice Treaty to be signed and allow Agenda 21 to roll out here because we don't have our constitution or our Magna Carta to protect us? Because that's, you know, that's the only thing we have. That's our get out of jail card at the moment. Anyway, um, I didn't read all of that because it's just too horrible for me to read, to be honest. I hope you've all read it. <laughs> but it's, it's, I mean, some of you that can't see it, I expect, but I'll read it out then. Um, transhumanists look far into the future, 30 years or more. Um, look at 2045.com. This is the 10 top transhumanist technologies in production today. Cryonics, which we've known for years actually. The preservation of human body for future med medical intervention. Virtual reality, in, in the mid-2020s, uh, um, you'll be able to buy full hepatic virtual reality suits um, in your supermarket. And uh, so if you don't like the world you're in, you can just go into virtual reality. It'd be great. Um, <laughs> uh, gene therapy, culminating in indefinite lifespans. Uh, we've done space colonization, uh, Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, the Millennial pro Project is working on that. It's colonizing Jupiter and Saturn uh, with Marshall T, Marshall Marshall T. Um, cybernetics, 3D printing, uh, hearing, vision enhancements, artificial bones, limbs, muscles and organs, artificial antibodies to prevent disease, robotics, 3D printing, self-replicating, uh, molecular nanotechnology, uh, nanofactories, mega-scale engineering, which we talked about, colonizing large structures on Earth and in space, mind uploading, brain prosthesis, artificial hippocampus, information uploaded directly to the brain, no need to learn, artificial intelligence, machines, software, mechanics, simulating humans, endowed, humans endowed human-like intelligence, planning, processing, communication, logic, and linguistics. Um, so, yeah, quite a lot of stuff there. Um, what do we do? We question the motives of leaders. Um, private oath takers have no place in public office. Think about your tax. You know, why are we paying for our arms to kill people in wars and worse? Um, try to find alternatives to smart technology, smart meters, smart phones, smart appliances, microwave radiation, weapon frequency. Uh, drink distilled, filtered water, uh, symbols and words on water containers, you know, M M Masaroto Moto. Uh, he's a wonderful Japanese guy, I'm sure people are aware of his work. But um, if you put the word love on a bottle of water, it actually changes the molecular constru uh, construction of that water. Uh, to raise your frequency by eating high vibrational food, drink raw juices, Listen to high vibration frequency music, the um, 432 hertz, uh, bowls, gongs, tuning forks, protection from EMF, organite, shungite, Faraday cage, hard, hard wire instead of Wi Fi, research the effects of vaccinations and their ingredients, question authority, GM foods, fluoride, mercury, aspartame, random acts of kindness, do random acts of kindness, it's great. Sunflower and hemp and iodine absorbs radiation from soil, water, and crude oil. Phyto remediation cleans up nuclear contamination. Know yourself. Yeah, constitution. 
Well, the guys will be doing it, dealing with that. Um, I should say swear allegiance to the barons, I've left out the R. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, a lot of our founding fathers, a lot of founding fathers of America came from here, and they had a very solid uh, kind of base about, you know, sovereignty and, and, and what's true and good and works. And they, they took it all over to America, and it's, it, it's, it's only that that's holding the southern states um, from Agenda 21. So I think it's all being played out again, um, which uh, is, is incredible. Um, it's your birthright, except no human intervention between you and your divine creator. You have a natural birthright to shelter, natural food, you're doing more to be done this, haven't we? Yeah, Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Doctor Evil, how would you take over the world? Now, I was thinking about this the other day. Um, and if, if you were Doctor Evil and you were trying to take over the world, how would you do it? You'd do it by stealth, because otherwise you can't. There's more of us than there are of them, really, isn't there? And um, you'd probably do it a bit like they're implementing Agenda 21, because you. You get a really good idea, like sustainability and all these things that sound absolutely, really sound and wonderful, and really as though it's for humanity and it's good. But would a good person actually take all the humans out of the out of the countryside and put them in urban housing, take away their private transport, and on the on, on the you know the premise that actually cars are not sustainable, and I we know that cars use petrol, and that isn't good, but they killed the bloke that made them run on water, you know? It's just, all this stuff is a nonsense, and it's a, it's a plan to get us to do what they want us to do, and to be vulnerable. They've taken away our, our, the way that we grow our food, the way that we live our lives in a, in a natural way. You know, they've taken away our ability to um, to, to, to actually be sustainable. We talk about sustainability, but are we sustainable? No, we're not. We don't grow anything, we don't produce anything. Um, you know, if, if literally, if the ports did close down, we would be stuffed with people. We'd be completely stuffed because we don't grow any, what well, we, we do in that. I think we'd be fine here, actually. <laughs> um, but in the rest of the world, you know, say London or whatever, if literally there's only, I think there's two days worth of food in every supermarket, is that right? So, you know, more strong really. I mean, it, I, I don't know what the, what the agenda is here, but it seems to me as though, you know, my father fought um, the Second World War, God rest his soul. He, was, um, he fought the Battle of Britain, and he would be turning in his grave right now because actually we didn't win the war. Because Operation Paperclip, it's still going on. There is a there, Hitler's agenda, and I believe this to be absolutely true, Hitler's agenda is rolling out all over Europe right now, all over America and, and, and Australia. And if we don't stand up, if we don't rise up and actually fight this beast, we are going to be stopped. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart, because you know, my father really so he fought the Battle of Britain and we're fighting the Battle of Britain again. And and it's it's Can um, I say without being do. sorry to interrupt no, go ahead. we need to come out of Europe to be able to do it. Oh absolutely. It's the only way we can do yeah, it. Yeah, and, and and we need we're too soft, we're British, so we don't say what we need no, to say, no. we don't do what we need to do. Are you you kid, by the way? Yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you know, it's it's difficult because, you know, I, I'm not a political per person, and I, well, I, I, I... you need to be, because we're all political, otherwise we're going into Agenda 21, but fast. Okay. 2017 is too late to, to have a vote to make. No, I totally... Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that score. There's a lot of things I don't agree with about you, Kip, but... Oh, I know, you. I know, I know, it's, it's difficult. It's what difficult. other choices do we have to get out of the EU? Tell me that. <laughs> no, I won't... No, all right, sorry, I'm being told off. Right, okay. Um, right, now, I don't know if my friend Ishtar's here. I don't think she is. 
I've got a lovely friend called Ishtar, and she wrote a fabulous, she's a journalist, and she wrote, she lives here, she wrote an amazing story, um, and a paper, it was, a, it was an article about Agenda 21, and she likened it to, um, to this story of uh, Rama and Hanuman, the monkey god. And Rama was trying to kill this many-headed hydra, and um, she likened the hydra to Agenda 21, because it's got so many different Assets. And so many, you know, you've got flooding, you've got geoengineering, you've got GMO crops, you've got everything. And every time Rama fired an arrow into the head of a serpent, another one would pop up. It's a bit like those things you get at fairgrounds when they keep popping up and keep hitting them. And um, so, um, Hanuman, the monkey god, he's quite smart, and he said to Rama, um, don't, keep, don't fire the arrows at his head fire them into his honey spot, which is a little spot above the solar plexus. So Rama did what Hanuman said, and he fired this arrow into the, into the serpent's honey spot, and it died, it just went blah, 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 sort of died. Um, and we are the honey spot for Agenda 21. We are the ones that will actually bring us out of, of Agenda 21. And, um, and also, um, if, you know, I, I believe our, our Magna Carta that's protected us for, since 1215 and our constitution that's protected us for as long will actually be our honey spot. And with that, that's a little segue into Lance and Dave um, speaking about the constitution and Magna Carta. And that's the end of my bit. Thank you very much. Would you like a 10 minute smoke break?